Uh, I have another role as well. I'm the vice president of the European Evaluation Society. Uh, this is the last session of the first uh, conference day, day and uh, we will focus on one uh, small piece of this puzzle of national evaluation capacity in the SDG world. Uh, the topic of this session is the role of bilaterals and the network of the bilateral evaluation offices, that is the OECD, DAC Evalnet, in supporting evaluation capacity in the SDG world. Uh, the way we have planned this session is that we will start with a uh, presentation that gives us the context. Uh, after that, we have a panel, short introductions, but what we really want to do is to have a discussion with the audience. So, and I think that's the, a good way of, of spending the last session of the day. So we encourage everybody to a very active, active uh, discussion. Uh, uh, I'll uh, start by introducing our presenter, and that's the only PowerPoint point for this uh, session. I'm pleased to welcome Winston Niasulu, who is the Assistant Budget Director Ministry of Finance, Economic Planning and Development, and Winston comes from Malawi. And as I said, this is the presentation that gives us the context. Uh, the topic of the presentation is steps towards successful evaluation of sustainable development goals. So, Winston, if you please uh, start the session. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Winston Yasuru. Uh, from Malawi. I'm Assistant Budget Director from Minister of Finance. Um, I have a presentation on steps towards successful evaluation, uh, evaluation of sustainable development goals. Um, basically, I, I think this presentation, just like anyone else, um, I was trying to look at the sustainable development goals and how, thinking in line of my country, how best we can take into account um, the evaluation for the SDGs, um, and, and so uh, the presentation, it has got a, a very brief introduction, and then I'll talk on the steps towards successful evaluation, and then some challenges uh, that uh, um, I was able to see that we, we might have uh, in the evaluation of SDGs, and then um, a brief conclusion. So as a matter of introduction, the 2015 uh, NEC conference theme points out to the importance of evaluation as a means of verifying progress made towards the achievement of uh, sustainable development goals in order to um, improve people's lives. Uh, so the presentation, as I earlier said, I will be looking in context of my country, um, and then I also talk about the challenges. Um, just briefly on some of the um, uh, uh, steps towards successful evaluation of SDGs, uh, I should hope that the first step would be a review underlying national policies to SDGs. I think this was raised in the morning that it would be important uh, to localize uh, the sustainable development goals um, uh, first into the uh, country policies. And uh, so country policies need to be reviewed and aligned to SDGs. Uh, it looks like a, a simple statement, but I hope that I think there will be quite a lot in that in most of uh, our countries. Uh, in, order to, in order to bring those uh, the, the, the sustainable development goals. And I was just, uh, like in, in Malawi, the National Development Strategy, um, <clears throat> which we, we, we call the MGDS, uh, it, it, it covers a period of five years, 2011-2016, uh, so next year is expiring, and we're thinking that as we're starting the new, we're thinking about the new policy for Malawi, we'll be able to incorporate um, issues of the sustainable development goals. And then also there is a table that he tries to uh, look at just some of the gaps, but, but it's not a, a very detailed analysis, but just to see uh, how far our current policy uh, it is from uh, trying to incorporate the sustainable development goals. Um, so that's the table, just looking at the issues of alignment. And you will be able, were able to see, I was able to see that on a number of points, I think um, in most of the goals, there are still some gaps that really we need to, uh, as a country, will need to reflect on. Just, just a few uh, of, of the uh, sustainable women goals, just a few of them, like end poverty in all its forms. Um, when you look into our document, you could not really see a particular goal that articulates about that. It was being articulated in other areas, but not particularly on that. And then another one on end hunger, 
um, achieve food security and improve nutrition and promote sustainable agriculture. We have won in the Malay Growth and um, <coughs> um, in the MGDS, uh, which is ensure sustained availability and accessibility of food, of food to all Malawians. So when you look into the details of that, you'll be able to see that there, 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 there are still some gaps. Maybe the most interesting one is like the um, number five, um, the, the, the other on achieve gender equality and empower all women and girls. In our policy document, we've ensured that children grow into productive and responsible um, as citizens. You'll see that the women <coughs> um, uh, 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 aspect, and particular girls, is not really coming out very clear. So I think uh, uh, this is not a detailed analysis, but just to show that I think there will be quite a lot of work to look into our national policies and see whether they've incorporated the sustainable development goals. Um, and the, just uh, two months ago, when I think the leaders had, um, um, uh, we are discussing these uh, very issues, I think it's the work that we have to see that uh, we're able to incorporate uh, the uh, sustainable development goals. So the second step um, um, is formulate smart performance indicator targets to track progress in achievement of SDGs. Um, each country should formulate their own performance indicator targets in order to track uh, achievement made towards SDGs. Uh, the targets should be smart. This is because SDGs are broad and not easy to uh, to measure. You you'll be able to see that the SDGs are quite complex, and uh, to bring um, at uh, um, performance uh, indicators uh, that can be able to measure um, in terms of what the, the progress that we have in our countries. I think it is another important step. Um, then uh, to carry out uh, evaluations on SDGs. Um, each country should identify key institutions uh, that can summon and conduct evaluation of SDGs. And in, in our case, uh, we have the institutions like the uh, National Statistics Office, Minister of Finance, Economic Planning and Development, and Office of the President Cabinet. Just last year, uh, it, it's, it's when this uh, ministry was merged. Otherwise, we had the Minister of Finance as a separate ministry and the Minister of um, Economic Planning and Development as a separate institution, but now we are one and it was the Minister of Economic Planning and Development that was uh, so much looking at issues of uh, M&D. But now that it's merged, we, we just mentioned as one ministry, but there are different departments. Uh, it's the Department of Economic Planning and Development that they deal with the issues of that. And the, uh, it's, it's, uh, I think like in every country, I think it would be very important to know those institutions uh, that um, will be leading um, the evaluations on the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And I hope this will, will differ from country to country depending on the uh, institutional uh, arrangement. Um, uh, step number four, improve uh, capacity of evaluators and the M&D systems in governments. Uh, in order to summon and conduct credible evaluations, there is need for capacity building in government departments as well as the key institutions. Capacities can be directed on evaluators, M&D frameworks, evaluation database and systems. I think this is, is, is an issue of capacities. Um, Really, I think this one, it will also uh, depend on um, um, the level of capacities. Those countries that don't have capacities, I think they will need uh, more, uh, more support um, uh, uh, to try to build uh, uh, capacities for the evaluators and the systems, uh, M&D systems um, uh, in government. Um, and then I'll, I'll also talk on the, the challenges, uh, envisage challenges that uh, we might have as we are evaluating the uh, sustainable development goals. And uh, just a few of them, I know there are quite a number of them. In the presentation that we had in the morning, I think it was also one of the challenges that was uh, talked about that time was even the reviewing of the policies or the mainstreaming of the SDGs into national policies. That will be another challenge. But I think I, I had taken them as, as, as one of the steps, but I think it's also another challenge. But just on these ones, uh, SDGs are not uh, that smart. Uh, they're, they're quite broad and it will depend on uh, country interpretation and how they can be um, uh, localized. So I think it will be very important to, that each country understands uh, each one of the goals and how best they can be able to, um, uh, to, um, uh, to track uh, progress. Um, another one, I think, is the issue of uh, evaluation expertise uh, will differ from country to country, and, and there is need for close collaboration with institutions such as UNDP and other stakeholders. And I hope that this is where it becomes very important at uh, the discussion that we'll have uh, this afternoon in terms of the bilateral uh, agencies. Uh, because um, 
uh, countries are at, at, at different stages in terms of the expertise. Um, uh, so it would be important to, as NEC, I think w th there should be a way of coming up um, uh, 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 w w with an analysis that really you know which countries are lagging behind and those that need support and in which areas to ensure that uh, they're able also to uh, track progress in version of SDG. So that's the discussion that we'll be having um, on the law of bilateral <coughs> agencies, and I think that will be discussed uh, in detail. So um, just in conclusion, um, to create demand on evaluation of SDGs, citizens have to be made aware <coughs> on the SDGs so that governments are taken to task by their people in achievement of the same. I think this uh, point, it, 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 to me, is like a conclusion, but I think in the morning it was also discussed that I think it will be important to raise awareness um, about the SDGs, um, uh, not only uh, to, to the various governments, but also to the communities in the various um, uh, uh, nations, so that people know exactly um, uh, what has been said. Um, uh, 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 and so when the people know all this information, they'll be able to, um, uh, to ask their governments to ensure that these things um, are being delivered. Thank you. Thank you very much, Winston, for uh, setting the scene, giving us the context uh, of the discussion of this, this afternoon. But as I said when I started, this time we will focus on a small piece in this puzzle, and that is the role of the uh, bilateral development partners or bilateral donors, whatever uh, expression you prefer, uh, and their evaluation network in this uh, context and in the support that is uh, needed. I will start by asking uh, the panelists uh, to introduce themselves. So, Per, please. Uh, my name is Per Basto. Um, I am the head of the evaluation department in the Norwegian Development uh, Policy Agency. I have been working on these sorts of issues for about 20 years in different settings, but now representing a bilateral uh, uh, part. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Penny Hawkins. I'm head of evaluation for the Department of International Development in the UK. Um, like Per, I've also been grappling with the challenges of evaluation um, in organizations and beyond for over two decades. Thank you. Hello and good afternoon. My name is Hans Lundgren. I'm uh, managing the DAC Evaluation Network, which Penny is also the chair of. Uh, and it groups uh, around uh, 42 bilateral agencies, ministries, and independent evaluation units, and a number of the major multilateral banks and organizations. I will not speak too much about it, but there is a flyer in the back of the room that describes a little bit uh, what we are and what we do for those of you who are not so familiar with that. Thank you. Uh, my name is Zenda Ophir. I'm from South Africa, currently living in Geneva. I'm an independent evaluation specialist uh, who works across Africa and Asia on evaluation and related assignments. I suspect part of the reason why I'm here is that I've had the privilege of moving globally in different capacities, including uh, about a decade ago as uh, one of the first presidents of the African Evaluation Association, vice president of the International Organization for Cooperation in Evaluation, IOCE, and, and other things. So that gave me a perspective perhaps from the other side of the, of the uh, continuum of people engaged in this kind of work. Great. So, as I said, what we are looking for is an active discussion, but to get the discussion going, I will give uh, a few things uh, for my, my panelists to, to answer. Zenda has a specific role here. Uh, Zenda has promised, when the discussion has, has been uh, finalized, to summarize issues and then point to some issues that we may have missed during that, that discussion. But... Uh, Hans, Penny, and, and Per, the things that I would like to start with are, uh, first of all, uh, what in your case are the most important factors uh, that influence the role of uh, your support to national evaluation uh, uh, capacity development now and in the future? Are there, are there things that are new coming in 
the SDGs are an obvious uh, major element like Winston has just introduced. But are there other things that are influencing that? And then my second question is that uh, when you think about future priorities in support of national evaluation capacity development, uh, do we have the tools that we need? Are the existing processes and mechanisms, are they enough? Do they need to be changed? Or do we need something completely new and different? So let's uh, have short interventions by, by you first, and then we open to, the dis to a discussion with the, with the audience. Per, go ahead. Um, I think we can build on a lot of the experience we have had uh, the last 20 years. I mean, um, this morning when I came <laughs> in, I thought it was quite encouraging to see uh, so many representatives sitting in uh, being here representing 100 different countries. I mean, when we started this uh, uh, 20 years ago, it was only a handful of believers in evaluation uh, at the country level. And now this has developed. And listening to some of the presentations uh, uh, earlier today in the, in the panels, I mean, it's, it's, it's great to, to, to hear that uh, this has taken hold in so many countries. And I think that's my main point, uh, is to build on the bottom-up approach and not the top-down. We, as, uh, as donor agencies, we, we tend to believe that we have the answers to all the questions, which is entirely wrong. I mean, we often we, uh, we disturb more than we support, because we, we, we ask for all the reporting from what is happening at the country level. And reporting, uh, measurement reporting, can destroy uh, any good evaluation system. So I think it is important to, to accept that, uh, that the approaches need to take into account what is happening at the country level. The culture, the tradition, uh, the way of addressing uh, questions at the country level. So, uh, so um, let's continue where we are, uh, have started. Um, so let me start by that. So uh, you, to get the conversation started, um, I just really want to make three points. And none of the, these are points I'm going to make are new points. I think we all know these. Um, the difficulty is, is actually making it happen. So firstly, um, if evaluation is going to be developed in country and to be sustainable in a systemic sense, um, I think it's about working together with countries. So as Per said, we've done enough of demanding evaluative information from countries um, and flying in our consultants from the north to the south, and you know we know the story. So I think if we can change our approach and work with um, rather than demand from, I think we might make some more progress. But also acknowledge that what we're talking about here in working with is learning together and that that learning is two-way. So I think often we fall into the trap as donors uh, from the North to come in and think we know or uh, think we're, we're kind of t in a teaching role. Uh, I would challenge that because I think there's, a, there's as much to learn uh, as there is to, to share knowledge. Um, and in order for that to happen, we have to admit that in our countries, we may be um, resource rich, but we certainly haven't got our evaluation systems to any kind of perfect state. So we're still struggling with that ourselves. So let's be honest about that and say we're, we're all learning together here. Um, so, so that's about not imposing approaches as well. So if we're talking about how we do evaluation, again, there is no perfect evaluation. So um, we also acknowledge that context is king, if you like. So context, context, context. If we don't develop systems and ways of doing things that are appropriate for the context, again, we're going to fail. So role of bilaterals, I think... Um, 
that doesn't mean that, that, that we would you know, discontinue providing support. Uh, of course, that's really important. But supporting initiatives like peer learning, I think so far our, our support for evaluation capacity development has really focused on an individual level. So we've trained thousands of people now around the world. But are those people getting an opportunity to actually practice what they've learned? How do we actually make that happen? Um, how do we work at an institutional level, as Winston talked about, to actually develop capacity within institutions? And then at a systems level, at a whole country systems level, bearing in mind what I said about we haven't worked this out yet, so we have to work on that together. The hope that I have from the SDGs is when I look through the, the document, there are hooks there that I think we can use to persuade um, our own uh, governments as donors that this is worthwhile to support. So the statement that national ownership is key to achieving sustainable development, we know this, we haven't managed to make it happen as well as we could. Um, but the follow-up and review section, if you've looked through that, has a couple of references to evaluation that I think we ought to you know, write large, shout out, make sure that we use that as to our advantage to support the development of um, evaluation systems in country and in our own countries. Thanks. Thank you. I think uh, I'll start with your first question, which was uh, around the most important factors influencing the role of bilaterals. And I think uh, we are in a policy environment where there are opportunities for evaluation, certainly with the new SDGs, which are very important. But uh, one thing that is very important with them is uh, that they are universal, and they are universal in two senses, both for all nations and also within nations uh, for all actors. And recently at the OECD, we had a meeting with, uh, with the OECD countries, also developing countries, as we learned uh, earlier today. And we saw that, for instance, some uh, like Germany, Sweden, are quite prepared and have integrated this in uh, national sustainable development strategies with coordination mechanism and monitoring and, and thought about it. And, uh, and uh, really, it's into an agenda. While others see this as something that has been uh, maybe negotiated in New York uh, by the foreign ministry and now needs to be mainstreamed, explained, and understood by various ministries and local governments and others. So I think within our countries and within most countries, there are variable levels of awareness for getting to what is now the three most important things with SDGs, and that is implement, implement, and implement. This is an opportunity, of course, uh, for bilateral agencies uh, and foreign ministries to review their development cooperation agenda to see if it's in sync and in line with, with SDGs. And some have already progressed uh, to, to start doing that. So that's, uh, that's an important uh, development with regard to the SDGs. Uh, an opportunity, but also maybe some risk because the monit monitoring and evaluation will, will be um, secondary to at least to the first three steps of implementing and implementing and implementing. Now, there are a few other, I think, important policy developments that I, if we have time, I could go into. And, and one thing that I think is affecting a number of, of so-called donor countries is first uh, the resource situation. We have a few like the UK and, and Sweden that are keeping up volumes, but many others like your country and Denmark and the Netherlands are actually decreasing their, their aid programs. And many others, at least the European um, countries, are facing huge refugee costs. And the refugee costs can be counted as ODA for the first year. And this will certainly take out uh, a large chunk of the bilateral aid budgets for, uh, for at least a few years to come. So this is maybe among the policy changes that poses a little bit of a challenge to us in this field. At the same time, we do have opportunities, as I said, with SDGs and also with this new need for development of statistical capacity. There is already agreement on a new global partnership for 
sustainable development data and uh, pledges of important sums, for, including from the United States, for $21 million for global health and gender equity data. This is, uh, you know, put, and Kenya will host the first World Data Forum in 2016. This development is sort of a potential alley and important, I think, for, for the evaluation community. Underlying this trend, we also have demands of citizens and civil society in many countries for more transparency and accountability, and that also affects donor agencies in their work. And the growth of national evaluation societies, as we see positively here, is, is a reflection of this trend. Another policy environment and trend that we are seeing now is, uh, is actually the growing role of the private sector also in development cooperation. And blended finance, guarantees, equity operations are instruments used. And we're moving away from just the traditional aid grant programs. And this is accompanied in, in several countries with a move where bilateral agencies are closed down or merged with foreign and trade ministers, for instance, in Australia and Canada. So they're related to a broader policy issues on the role of aid in relation to foreign policy, policy coherence, national and strategic interest. And I think this is having implications for the environment, the work of bilateral agencies, and how they can work on the evaluation agenda as well. Thank you. Yeah, let me just uh, throw in one more question. But before that, I, I say that actually many of the things that you are saying resonate very strongly with, with my, my own, own ideas. I have been a person uh, who has said that, that uh, there is not enough evaluation capacity in the partner countries to do collaborative work in this field. I said, said this before I started coming to the next conferences because it's impressive uh, the, the capacity and thinking and development work that is that is going on. So now I always say that we have been looking in the wrong places. Uh, the, the capacity in many cases is there. And that links to something that, that Penny already said, that, that actually there would be huge opportunities of learning together because I also became interested in my own country's evaluation systems through first having worked on it in, in uh, development evaluation. And, and uh, I think that there is some capacity development needs there as well. So for, for once, we have a perfect opportunity for South-North uh, cooperation. And uh, Hansi's point on the uh, financial crisis and the decreasing aid budgets in many countries is a huge challenge because it has been difficult to prioritize support to evaluation capacity devel development even with the existing resources and, and the current situation does not make it, make it any easier. But the thing that I wanted to ask you additionally is that we have heard from Winston a very convincing case of the demand and need for evaluation capacity development. We hear very positive statements from you as well as this is a priority, there, there, are, there are challenges, but there are opportunities. My question is that how can we make it happen? How can we, how can we make the demand uh, be met with, with uh, support and, and supply? What are we not doing right at the moment? Today we meet in a UNDP setting. Next week it might be a World Bank setting. The week after an OECD setting. And then an, uh, a regional bank setting. And then we have the evaluation uh, association setting. And they all come to me and ask for funding. And it's impossible. I mean, given uh, what Hans is saying, uh, we cannot fund all these uh, different initiatives. So what bar one barrier is a lack of coordination between the different initiatives. I mean, it, there's so much competition among all these uh, global initiatives. We want to have our logo on different uh, tools and, and publications and, um, and uh, workshops and conferences. 
I hope someone can take the lead in doing some coordination. I mean, uh, it's ridiculous to have uh, uh, IPTET and CLEAR, uh, um, you know, in the same market without uh, even closer uh, coordination. So maybe that's something for a Valnet uh, to, to, to play that role or for whoever uh, would like to play that role. When it comes to Malawi, I mean, I mean <laughs> Malawi is one of Norway's f uh, 12 focus countries. So maybe it's easier to mobilize uh, support to Malawi because we have a great interest in, in many sectors in Malawi. But at the, at the aggregate level, uh, it, uh, it is the coordination challenge that we need to solve. So while we're on the topic of um, challenges and, and how we marshal support um, for evaluation capacity development, <clears throat> if we take it as read that you know, it's a good thing and something that we need to do, the reality is in terms of what donors fund is that we're in a, um, I guess, a competitive space, if you like, in terms of if we look at all the different things that where the funding can go, um, my experience is that it's, it's not the easiest thing to make the case for evaluation in the first place and then capacity development in evaluation secondly. So, um, you know, those of us who work in evaluation, of course, we think it's really important. But we have to acknowledge that, that there is a, a kind of unconscious or semi-conscious um, resistance to evaluation across the board, um, not just just from a donor perspective, but, but I think, you know, um, people that run development initiatives, interventions, uh, or any other kind of government program, um, there is this, this, uh, this resistance that, that one experiences. Um, so it's getting past that, and I think making a strong enough case for the, um, the difference that evaluation can make and what value it adds to amongst all the other things that, that, that we do and that we can fund. So I don't think as evaluators we've made that case strongly enough. And so if we want the investment in this, we have to get better at making the case for it. And that's not just on the donor side, that, that's also as a partnership together. Um, and what I was saying earlier, I think we have a good opportunity to do that right now. And, and if we can only seize that and, and make that case, so that, so that it's more likely that resources are put in this direction. Thank you. Yeah, building on what you're saying, which I agree with, is really to sort of create uh, more demand for evaluation. I think it's important because, in general, uh, politicians, I think, are quite favorable to getting better policies and better programs that work for the citizens, with the exception of some kleptocratic governments, of course. But in general, in order to be re-elected and to be popular, you need to have programs that work. So they are interested in programs that work, but we are not so good as evaluators to say that we have a tool for you that you can use to prove that these programs are working. So something that we are doing is not right. We are not good enough at advocacy, I think, at the targeted level to policymakers. And that's something we need to get together to do much better. And in non-technical way, so you know, simple, simple, so that politicians, ordinary people, and ourselves can understand it. Because we speak in a very coded language often that nobody understands. That's my first suggestion, and that links very much what you said. The other thing is I think we need to partner with development, developing country governments and institutions to do more collaborative and partner country-led evaluation based on demand like Malawi has expressed and others are expressing. Right now, we do not have a coordination mechanism. We don't have a mechanism to sort this out, to really funnel these demands and meet it in a constructive way. So we need to work out that. And I think we also need to be stronger in influencing our program managers in agencies who work on public sector governance, management, transparency, and all those issues, and to make evaluation and capacity support an integral part of such programs. Because, as we heard, evaluation units' direct support is going to be 
limited and likely to continue to be limited. But there are other ways of channeling funds. I mean, bilaterals, as we call them, they have direct programs, both in the public management side, through evaluations. They have funds in trust with the multilateral institutions. They also fund the multilaterals. They have ways of influencing the agenda. And then, uh, finally, I think we need also to do evaluation in a more capacity development friendly way. We can do it in the evaluations we're doing right now. Uh, and we need also to have a more targeted networking for knowledge exchange. We are networking, many networks it do exist now. Uh, I'm almost getting lost in the number of acronyms and uh, new networks that are being created every month, it seems, which is a great thing because people need to get together. But if we get together at all levels, it might be difficult also to really sort of get the discussion going. The network that I'm working and managing with are actually people who are managing and commissioning evaluations, and they have their problems, believe me, they have their issues. And you know, you have other issues when you're an evaluator or if you're on the other side of things. So maybe you need more targeted networking. That's my point, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I just want to add a point, I think, uh, uh, really that I think the uh, donor support or the, 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 the financing that might be coming uh, towards evaluations might be going down. But I think it's also very important um, uh, to, to ensure that there is commitment uh, of government towards evaluation. I think the commitment aspect is very important, uh, even if the money is going to be there from the donors. But if there will be no commitment by governments, it will not, uh, will not be able to achieve much. Yeah, again, I, I fully agree, and, and thinking about the evaluation capacity development initiatives that we have had, very often they still focus on supply side, doing evaluations, and not on the demand side, or, as, as Win Winston is just pointing out. But let's then uh, give the opportunity of, of the audience to, to participate. Uh, have we asked the right questions? Have we provided the answers to, to resolve this uh, issue? And thank you for the great insights that you have provided so far. Um, I think you, you've partially touched upon something that I'm going to ask, but I, I'd like to have more clarity on um, what are the, I mean, what is the, the feeling in, uh, in the members of OECD DAC about the, how much of a priority is this agenda for, for them? I, I'm sure that the, you have been, you are here, so you are very interested. But I, I would like to hear about the others, the rest that are not here, and um, how much, if it's a priority, how much are you willing to sustain this effort? Because this effort is going to be something that um, it will take long time, and uh, it, it will not be something like it would happen from one day to the other. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Ariel Hauge from the Independent Evaluation Office of UNDP. Thank you very much uh, to the panel uh, for those reflections. Uh, allow me to put on the table a, 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 a comment or take it as a reflection for you to respond to as you see fit, but it's also a, a challenge to the participants and, and us as an evaluation community at large. I, I submit to you that between you being the evaluation specialists and professionals and um, seniors uh, on the donor side and between uh, us in the middle on development agents, multilateral institutions, we have a big, a deep and dirty secret in common. Uh, uh, when we talk to you, we have very, very easy for us and you to agree about uh, with the importance of evaluation. But the, the, the challenge that we have, which is very parallel, uh, uh, on your side and on our side is that of changing the minds of our own principles. We can come to you and, and, and beg for money and, and you have a small chunk of your ODA budget to conduct your evaluations. And sometimes we come, we come scratching at the door and, and we can get some leftover change that, that, that you have to support us. But, but what we need to do, of course, is I, I submit to you, part from the idea that we need to propagate evaluation capacity at the country level as somehow being an extension of evaluation practice as it happens to be appropriate and pertinent to our very unique 
jurisdictional arena, the UN and, and similar agencies. What, maybe we have an opportunity now of framing evaluation, a national evaluation capacity, not as an extension of evaluation practice in the OD arena, but as a good governance proposition. We shouldn't be scratching for getting a little chunk for you to yield a little bit of your 0.2% of your, the ODA budget of your government. No, we should be playing for the evaluation capacity development to be a big chunk of the 40% of ODA flows that is going to public sector management, uh, uh, government strengthening. Uh, uh, and maybe that is what we should try to bring our minds to is how then anchoring in the SDG as a, the current piece that we all share. Uh, are there some pivots? Are there some anchors in there that will work to the effect of changing the minds of, of the principles, be it at the recipient country government side, be it at the development global multilateral institution side, be it uh, amongst the policy makers and stakeholders and taxpayers for that matter on the donor side. Thank you. Daniel Svoboda from the Czech Republic. Uh, it was mentioned that we should build on uh, the mechanisms already working and on the results already reached. So I would like to ask two very related questions. In your opinion, what is the chance to coordinate and share mechanism and uh, look for synergies at global level, especially between the global partnership for de effective development cooperation, agreed four years ago in Busan, and global partnership for sustainable development uh, to be established <laughs> now. And the second similar question, uh, in your opinion, what is the chance to identify, evaluate, and support synergies between all these 17 different goals and 169 targets and 300 indicators. Is it possible or not? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Let's take these questions uh, first. Maybe I'll turn to Hans first because there were, there were questions that, that you are best positioned to, to answer amongst, amongst the questions that were raised. Well, I'm not sure I'm in best position, but uh, I will try to, <laughs> to at least provide a partial answer to some of it. Well, your point, uh, Ari, I, I tried to make it, uh, you know, that when I was saying that we need to influence in a better and stronger way uh, the public management uh, agenda and governance and, and accountability agenda. I think that is uh, where you can see a considerable shift if you're able to do that. But that's also related to the point I made about actually making the case for evaluation to politicians and policymakers in a simple way. I'm, we saw this thing coming out now on um, uh, evaluations that make, uh, make a difference. Uh, and I think that's a very good example of tangible things that you can look at and make a difference. We, we have other examples coming from something that was DFID supported in Zambia. Started small like a pilot project, evaluated thoroughly, quite expensively, found a big success. Government wanted to scale up. Donors came in, and now million families are benefiting from this child support. You know, if you have evaluations that really can prove that this works, you can convince policymakers, and you can get the flows of funding going for it. So that's the way I think we need to work. On, um, on your broad question, who can coordinate all these global various outfits that you mentioned, uh, well, what's above, uh, what's above the global organizations? I don't know, somebody maybe higher up. But certainly, you know, being, um, it must be those that have a global mandate. We don't have a global mandate. We, we in the sense, uh, UNS is a global organization. And um, I guess that's, that's where um, you have to seek, decide to seek synergies between the whole thing. On the SDG outcome, and um, process targets. We, I, we looked at this and I think when you go through them, there are maybe 110 outcomes targets really and about 60 or so that are process targets actually, which is not the official figure, but it's probably around there. 
So, you know, they, they, there should be some synergies to be found, but that's a lot of them. And just this week, in a parallel session, as we heard, the UN statistical people are meeting and trying to sort out the indicator issues around this. And hopefully can, we'll come down to something which is more close to 100 than above it, or below 100 even, we will see. But there is certainly some need to as much as possible make this as a feasible thing to report on for governments. So that's still a challenge, I think, and an unsolved issue, but um, yeah, I think that's where we are now. Maybe you would compliment. Yeah, I mean, if I can add to that, I think um, just a comment on the statistical side of things. Um, I don't think it matters how many indicators we have. Indicators will only get us so far. Um, and we can't easily claim or make the claim that development is working on the basis of a set of indicators. Um, I'm not saying that we don't need indicators, but I think it's critical that we have evaluation to actually provide a much more comprehensive um, explanation story, however you want to um, describe it, to say, actually, what has happened? How has it happened? Who is it making a difference for? Where is it making a difference? And, and in what ways is it making a difference? So we, there's a bunch of questions that can't be answered by indicators alone. And I think as evaluators, we need to be talking with our, with our colleagues who work on the statistical side to actually make clear what that complementarity is and why it's important. And I think in, in, in uh, uh, Ariel, is it the, the point that you made on the SDGs, as I said earlier, there's text in the, the Transforming Our World document that gives us hooks to take this forward. So, so when it says in paragraph 74G, <laughs> you can tell I'm a bureaucrat, right? <laughs> um, that the follow-up and review will be rigorous, and that's however you want to interpret the word rigorous. I know that's quite a, quite a controversial term. Let's leave that to one side. Will be rigorous and based on evidence informed by country-led evaluations. We have that wording in the document. And I know in the UN, wording is really important. So let's use it. I think uh, one of the mistakes we made uh, during the high-level forums on uh, aid effectiveness was exactly to call it aid effectiveness. It was all about making aid more uh, effective. This is not about aid. This is about governance. I agree with you, Ariel. Uh, and we need to, to link with all good initiatives uh, uh, at the country level, being it statistical capacity development uh, or supreme audit uh, capacity or other aspects of, 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 of um, elements of governance. Uh, I remember something we were engaged in 20 years ago was the linkage between evaluation and planning, evaluation and budgeting, evaluation and other parts of government uh, activity and, and, and tools and, uh, and processes. So it's back to this being country-led and, uh, and building on the needs and, and the requirement at the country level. If we, if we hijack this into being a reporting tool, uh, then we're, we're going to lose. Uh, yeah, from technical to political, I think that's, <laughs> that's the, the answer. There was also a question on whether this is a priority or not. I can only answer for my own uh, very enthusiastic institution. Uh, Finland has put this as a, as a priority, but the way that we have had to resolve it is we have reserved part of our evaluation budget to national support to national evaluation capacity. If this funding would have to come through our country programs. It would not be prioritized by my colleagues in the ministry, and I doubt whether it would be prioritized by our partners in, in, in the South. So, so uh, it is a challenge, but, but I'm, 
I, I think I'm, I'm very much agreeing with the, with the challenge of, of uh, the hooks and the advocacy work that needs to be, start, be done outside of the evaluation community. More interventions from the, from the public. Hi, I'm Cindy Um I self-identify as an evaluator, but oddly I was across town at, in SCAP for the negotiations on the indicators for the SDGs. And I apologize to those of you who were next door in the last session and heard me say some of this. But if I could, because Hans and Penny touched on a few things. Um, the UN gave to the, uh, the UN Statistical Commission the job to identify the indicators. And there are definite advantages and disadvantages to this. And as I watched them for two and a half days, heroically trying to negotiate indicators for 179 targets, I was so struck by what an unmanageable task this is. I was also struck by the differences between statistics, particularly the representatives were from national statistical offices, different from monitoring and evaluation. Rejected time after time anything that was an index. Um, in terms of national statistics, indices are too messy apparently. I personally, live in a messier world and I'm quite comfortable with um, indices, but, but not in that crowd. It was also extremely important to them that the information be owned by their governments. I mean, they're, they're in the business of national statistics. Hans mentioned getting down to 100. Well, of course, they are the statisticians. They can't whittle this down. They must have at least one indicator for all of the 179. And of course, most of those are, mul well, many of those are multi-part and require more than one indicator to try to capture it. So the question is, how do we as a community reach out to support them? They've done such a good job of what they're doing, but this community brings so much wisdom that could help them in terms of trying to accomplish their job. Thank you. A few more interventions. Uh, my name is Anson Insone. I'm an m and specialist for the UNDP Zambia Country Office. Uh, I've got two comments, within them some small questions. I think the first one is something that has been touched upon and noted, I think. Historically, we see more capacity or more responsiveness towards donor or is it bilateral partner driven projects. They are more evaluated, of course, than maybe gov government programs. But it has tended to create a certain kind of culture, maybe, which is sort of like more compliance than really learning. So, I mean, it's just to stress. I don't know what lead interventions are there to try and build on that. What sort of incentives uh, the partners bring to bear here? Is it that if a project is very successful, you get more money? Or if it's not, then they have to look at other ways of how a country can be assisted. The other one is, uh, I think Norway has touched on that, I think the issue of joint assistance strategies uh, from a defective point of view. There are variances in terms of performances, failures and successes in different areas, but it has a tendency to actually affect the national capacity as much. So we see reversals in terms of budget support, then back to direct you know, bilateral support. So I don't know what the commitment is, whether the, the issue here is to move forward regardless of the challenges towards budget support. <laughs> so I just want to get your impression on some of that. Let's take a few more. I am <coughs> Prakash Kumar from India. And for the last 20 years, I am uh, implementing the program, multilateral, bilateral. And so it's always a challenge for the implementers that how a, the evaluation results that has come out, how it can be it can be influenced uh, to the federal or state government, how it can be mainstreamed. So thank you very much for a very insightful uh, discussion on this. But the problem that uh, uh, we are facing in particularly in India, that lack of coordination is not only at the donor, multilateral and bilateral and government level, but between the donors itself, between the donors itself. I have many examples where a single program has been evaluated by different donors in a different way. That is completely giving a, a different confusing uh, signals to the government. So when we used to go to for a particular evaluation which has got a, uh, a scaling up potential, 
then we always got this from the government side that this is your program, you are funding it, so you are attributing your evaluation results to your program. So, so I will just take it one step further. It's not only lack of coordination and collaboration, there is a trust deficit also between the bilateral, multilateral funded programs and the programs being funded directly by the federal or the state government. So my question to the esteemed panelists, panel members are, how do we have any plan in place that how we are going to bridge this deficit gap? Because what is happening in the coming, coming years, the nature of aid is going to change. The multilateral and bilateral agencies has to build the capacity of the federal and the state government for uh, having capacities to evaluate their own programs. And this is only possible if this lack of trust uh, can be disseminated and all other partners should come at a single platform to support uh, capacities for the country. Thank you. And one more. Madam Moderator, distinguished uh, panelists, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I have uh, three comments, uh, uh, very short. Uh, Kezang from Bhutan. Um, last year, we were, Bhutan was part of a cross-country study that we conducted uh, with Bangladesh and Nepal uh, with the help of EVAL partners, uh, IOCE, on what we called uh, management response to evaluation. And uh, one of the stark findings of our study was that, and it's very simple, that uh, donors, intergovernmental organizations, interna international NGOs, CSOs, have, uh, have an evaluation culture in place. And we found that uh, uh, our government, uh, governments in this case, three countries, didn't have uh, mostly uh, no evaluation policy uh, or either being uh, developed. So in this uh, context, uh, uh, I, was, uh, I was wondering whether, whether the haves of uh, the evaluation culture should actually impress upon governments to, uh, I, th I think it will be a fairly easy uh, in the sense of uh, providing the donor funding and along with it the requirement to have country uh, specific evaluation laws, policies, regulations in place. Uh, uh, I, I thought uh, that that was something that uh, came out very starkly and uh, might be relevant. In terms of capacity building, uh, rather than I think uh, doing short term, you know, uh, trainings where consultants come in, where donors come in, uh, two or three days uh, training, um, I think it would be good to look at how we can integrate into uh, uh, curriculum, uh, say in, in, in national institutions, universities, uh, and we don't have to start from ground zero because uh, institutions like uh, IBDET, CLEAR, I think we, uh, you mentioned it uh, earlier, uh, I think it's, it's basically customization of those curriculum to fit into the development stages of various countries, in, in, in especially in the developing countries, capacity building. So uh, the third uh, point uh, was that I wanted to uh, also make mention of gross national happiness, Bhutan's uh, development philosophy. Uh, and uh, if you haven't heard about it, please uh, feel free to uh, Google. Uh, it's, it's, it's there. And uh, uh, we were lucky to have been able to contribute to the SDGs itself. Uh, uh, the gross national happiness has four pillars. I'm not going to tell you that because then you will not Google it, Google for more information. Uh, and then nine domains, uh, 33 indicators. I think it's not many. We have 17 SDG goals. Uh, so I think uh, if, if you are interested, uh, uh, we, uh, I'm sure our government will be happy to input uh, to the whole process. I'm also, I also know there is already uh, some inputs going into that. Uh, and uh, I thought I'll make a mention of this and we'll be happy to uh, input uh, to the whole uh, process of uh, coming up with uh, whatever is relevant and, and you know to the international community and will be useful for countries thank you very much thank you thank you interesting and important linkage is including the link to curriculum development and, and education uh, i'll give you uh, one more chance to respond to the comments from the audience Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know how to respond to this uh, because uh, I agree. <laughs> These are some of the barriers. Uh, I mean, uh, as bilateral donors, we tend to be short-term 
we have a short-term perspective. We change our approach all the time. So one, uh, one day we believe in, uh, in uh, long-term budget support, the next day we believe in something else. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's how we are. Um, and we also have, uh, we also have uh, the success in any capacity development ex uh, effort is variable. I mean, we don't, it, it, again, to me, it comes back to the fact that we tend to, to export our approaches to the country level. So, I, I mean, the only solution that I see in the long run is to make this truly country-led. Uh, and for you to take, to be in, in the driver's seat and for us to support the best way we can do. But then, uh, so, I mean, stop accepting that we put demands on, on, on you. Uh, try to turn this around. I'm wondering, does anyone remember the Paris Declaration? Yeah. I mean, I actually think the principles in the Paris Declaration, um, it's hard to argue with them. But we suffer from amnesia. So for some reason, we have to keep reinventing. Um, because I think if you look back at the Paris Declaration, some of the questions that have been raised, the issue of donor coordination... Um, I think we call that harmonization. The issue of country-led approaches, that was alignment. You know, so I, I won't go on, but, but we know what we, what we ought to be doing. Um, and, and I think that declaration was based on actually a lot of knowledge that we built up, um, you know, over 50 years or so or longer or whatever. Um, it's just that we know with our heads, but for some reason... Um, it's quite difficult for us to, um, you know, work together and make it happen. And, of course, politics gets in the way. We can't, we, you know, that's, that's the reality that we work in. And, you know, it's, it's, that's the human condition, I guess. Um, I think the point on um, moving uh, from the individual training, which goes to something I said in the introduction, uh, to integrate into national curricula, I think that's... a I completely agree with that. Um, I also think if only we could do that in our own countries. Um, you know, there aren't many countries in the world that have um, universities and institutions that teach evaluation well. So it's generally tacked on to something else. So you can, you can do a qualification in, in development studies or whatever. You may have one paper in something called M&E, right? Which, which will give you a familiarization, but actually, you know, good, solid education and, and teaching know-how and evaluation is scarce worldwide. So, you know, hopefully as a community, we, we, we can help to influence that in the right direction. Um, now, in response to uh, the gentleman from Bhutan, um, I can only admire... Um, the, 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 the concept and everything you've done in, in gross national happiness. I think, you know, it's something that we would all wish for. Um, so, you know, I personally am very keen to learn on how that's going. Um, but, yeah, that's probably all I've got to say about that. Yes, uh, starting maybe with the last point there, that uh, uh, OECD is uh, traditionally a very economic organization, uh, but we are moving beyond... GDP. We have our own better life index. Maybe we are inspired by Bhutan. I don't know, but we certainly increasingly realize that there are many other factors uh, that we are not counting in present GDP terms. So you can create your own better life index and weigh what you think is important in terms of education, health, security, housing, and other things that are very important to our lives. And we, our economics and other directors are working on this very much. So we, we are seeing a movement, uh, I think, not only uh, among us, but in other, other institutions where we're getting a broader what is um, maybe happiness at some point. <laughs> Just a parenthesis maybe on that. 
I can't but agree to what, what has been said in terms of country lad and um, the partner in the driving seat. I think that's, that's the key conclusion in, in a way and that uh, we agree on and it, it relates to many good principles that we have adopted but seem unable to actually implement and um, at least to, to the full extent that we would like it to be implemented. So um, the dysfunctionality that some of you have pointed out with lack of coordination, I think it, it, it comes from this trust issue. And uh, in some way, I think we have to recognize that evaluation is not just about learning things. We have a lot of evaluation because there is a trust issue. There is this accountability issue. Just look at the multilateral institutions. How many ways of assessing the multilateral institutions don't we have among the so-called bilaterals or the funding agencies, from individual multilateral aid reviews to various multilateral instruments and peer reviews, about 10 different things. All of this actually boils down to the fact we don't trust that they spend it very well and effectively. So we have to do this sort of different assessment instruments. Now, co overcoming that, I can only see working together is the only way to do it. And, uh, you know, country-led driver, but let others in to, to see how it goes and make it a more rational process. We tried with the Paris Declaration. We turned it around. We're saying, now you should evaluate the donors. And actually, that's what got that going. And about 21 countries said, we want to hold the donors to account. They say they will do this, so let's see if they do it. And I think that's the process we try to build in what we call in the network the collaborative donor collaborative partner initiative. Um, what do we call it now? CPDE, Collaborative Partner Donor Evaluation Initiative, where 14 countries participated. It's also turning it the other way around, and we'd like to see more of that. And we're now thinking we're doing a survey to see how we can come forward with this initiative. Uh, in, in the task team that we have on evaluation capacity development. And I think that's the way forward, really, that, uh, uh, you know, you evaluate your own programs, and then you evaluate to what extent the donors are contributing to those programs. And we should support you in that process. Thank you. Thank you. I would now turn to Zenda, who has kindly promised to be our discussion com uh, commentator, and, and she has also promised to uh, summarize a little bit what, what we have discussed. Zenda, please. Thank you very much. Um, many points to summarize. I'll do my best. Um, it is kind of scary that when I wrote down my own views, like there's almost perfect alignment with this discussion and the, con, um, the contributions. In the first place, I want to emphasize what I think it was Per mentioned right in the beginning, is that much has been achieved. I know there are analyses that say there have been modest achievements to date in ECD. I would like to disagree. I think almost all of us will have a story to tell about how ECD support from OECD DAC and related agencies have made some stimulus that assisted our own capacities. I want to quickly give two examples. CEDA, Swedish CEDA, provided funding for us in South Africa to get Michael Quinn Patton to come to South Africa for the first time. This was in 2002 before we had any notion of an evaluation community. And I brought Michael Patton out and I know that nobody wanted to support us, but CEDA did. And I can give a direct trace from that visit of Michael Quinn Patton to the establishment of what is today DPEME in government. I can trace it directly. I know how that process worked to get there, as well as to SAMEA, the formation of SAMEA, which just concluded a 500-person, very vibrant, uh, very successful conference. Um, similarly, the Norwegians, NORAD, provided funding in 2007 to the stream, we called it uh, Making Evaluation Our Own, stream of work that we promoted by bringing international as well as local people together within the NIAMIG conference, the fourth 
African Evaluation Association Conference, which is leading to an increasing focus in Africa on trying to provide thought leadership on the continent in how to make evaluation our own called Made in Africa evaluation. Who knows where that could go? So it's these stimulus, it's like somebody once said, you, you, you sow seeds and you don't know, you will never see the flowers, but you help to sow the seeds. So let us celebrate that and say that this was a good 15 years, I think for Africa, certainly about 15 years of support from, from an organization like yours. But very clearly, there is a need, it's, there's a new phase. There's really a new phase in the world, a new phase in how development is perceived, conceived through the SDGs and other things. And also, it's a new time in the world where resources come from other places, where aid resources are diminishing. And therefore, we all need to think anew, and as has been emphasized here, collaborate in different ways. So perhaps the first very important point in terms of thinking uh, how this can go forward in future came from many observations that said it is time for the countries, let's call them the young, maybe emerging powers in evaluation or the younger powers in evaluation. It is time for our countries to take more ownership and responsibility and provide more resources. Uh, uh, and, and, and it links very obviously to how evaluation is perceived as a profession in our countries and in your countries. Because in both cases, we will have to sell the profession in ways that really emphasize what kind of value this profession adds. And the fact that we are not able to do that relates to things beyond our control, like the politics and their use of evidence that are sometimes very opposing forces. But it also says something about our own ability to sell the profession in ways that will enable greater resource flows and support for ECD. So this is a first responsibility I would like to place on our younger emerging powers. We need new, new strategies and we need new ways of thinking about this and shift the power relations also, where it's not anymore the power of a donor over a recipient, but it is the power of equals that work together towards common purpose, with ECD as one of the common purposes. And ECD should be conceptualized to be something that help both or all countries um, uh, within their respective responsibilities and spheres to address the current challenges before us. And as somebody rightly said, it's not anymore uh, the older evaluation countries know and the others don't and we must transfer the knowledge. We are grappling with similar challenges. So we need to work together in order to address things like how do we make sense using systems methodologies out of the complexity? How do we not uh, succumb to indicator writers where all we do is count and monitor? but we actually evaluate what lies be beneath the indicators to make sure that development is truly sustainable and, in and durable, right? These are all challenges that we all face. So that kind of collaboration will be critical. There are people like Michele Tarsila who has done some really interesting work on ECD and he calls something transformative ECD, which I agree with. We should try to consider what kind of strategies should we follow to make ECD transformative in this phase of our um, SDG and related uh, type of work? And um, one way to do that, which he and others obviously also espoused, is to have a more coordinated, systematic, um, more planned approach to ECD where you actually have a, a change logic, a theory of change for ECD within each country, perhaps within each region, perhaps globally, a cascading set of theories of change. But not only for ECD, but for ECD within development. In other words, connecting that directly to, to the role that it plays within development. 
in each of our countries and regions. Um, and also, obviously, for the role that it would play in enhancing the SEDG uh, management. And perhaps that can feed back into the previous point I made. So we also need a theory of change of the trajectory that evaluation itself should follow in order to support development. We actually need a series of theories of change to understand what it is that we are actually trying to do in ECD and how that's positioned within uh, both development and the evaluation field itself by thinking about our own evolution and the way that should and could lead in future given the challenges, let's say, for the next 15 years. Um, that means that we need to define ECD very well within our own contexts. We need to understand that it's a multi-layered concept from micro to macro level, where micro is very local and, and up to global level. Um, we need to be able to track our successful, what, what we call success in ECD. In other words, we need to understand how to monitor and measure it if we want more things to monitor and measure. Um, and we need to use that data and make it publicly available so that we can adapt our strategies quickly if we see only a certain group in a particular country benefits, for example, and that group is perhaps not the right group or too narrow a group, let's, let's have alternative strategies. But it means we need to actually understand what we're achieving. Do we want to go that route? It is a slightly top-down plan, centrally planned approach. We need to decide. Whatever we do, we'll have to do, have to do it in collaboration with our partners uh, in OECD DAC. Now, we can also continue to do things in a more ad hoc way. And then I would propose that we do focus on particular priorities that are hopefully still part of good series of change around this. And I would highlight some of these, and it touches on many of the points that you have made. Um, I believe that it is essential to continue with exposure. Exposure really develops capacity. What do I mean by that? Exposure of people to one another, and I want to emphasize what some of you said, it's two ways. It's from the, the older evaluation countries to the younger and vice versa. I want to emphasize that things like events, supporting conferences, supporting training, short term but preferably training that is also over a period of time well, well developed in terms of, of long term vision of what training can be, mentoring or peer to peer learning, uh, sharing of knowledge, there are so many ways in which we can promote exposure to one another. We really do learn through that, these events are really a, a clear sign of that. It would be a pity to lose that. We need to find incentives to enhance the quality of all of our evaluations. And I want to point fingers to all of us. We need to ensure maybe we can use more prizes and awards and competitions like some of those that have been done. Perhaps we have too little of that because we need to ensure that our capacity has the right quality. I want to reinforce the issue of thought and practice leadership on the continent, and I don't mean that in an elitist way, but I mean we need research to be done on evaluation, and that has to be supported. Too little of that has been supported. In this new phase, we need to understand more about evaluation in our own context, and so how that links to global evaluation trends and issues and methodologies, and how all of these can enhance one another. So we need a, a much stronger focus on support to thought leadership and practice leadership. Uh, also to address some of the challenges that the SDGs throws at all of us. And again, there are many mechanisms through which that can be done. And by the way, including aspects like thinking about Bhutan's uh, gross national happiness concepts, as they would relate to development, would form part of that. I'm a great admirer of what they have done since I visited in 2007. Uh, who coordinates? I would suggest regional, and by that I mean if you take Africa at sub-regional level, like um, Southern Africa, Eastern Africa, and so on. I think that would be a good space to coordinate our own actions 
and see what kind of mechanisms can be brought to bear from yours to work at that level. I think the continent level can be somewhat problematic and country level may be too granular. And perhaps we can have cohesive strategies and initiatives at regional level and some coordination at that level or perhaps coordination at all these levels. Um, we'll have to think about what could work best. We need to understand that the last 15 years focused very much on government and evaluator um, capacity building. I think there's space to be made for commissioners of all kinds, capacity building, and civil society, as some of you mentioned, parliamentarians, civil society, so that their capacities are also built. I think that is part of a next phase of thinking about this. Um, I want to throw into the pot the fact that we need, as part of making the case for our profession, we need to understand quite fundamentally how to promote the value of our organization, uh, uh, sorry, of our profession, also to the smartest people in the world. And by that I mean very seriously that I believe evaluation is very challenging conceptually and intellectually. If we want to judge other people's performance, it's not about doing a survey, it's not a technical exercise. It's about the ability to integrate across many things. And you need the smartest people drawn from many, many different disciplines to come into this arena. And I think part of our ECD needs to focus on professionalization and how that professionalization will enhance the quality of the people that enter or at least become interested in collaborating with this arena. And I want to end with a point that all of this will not be sustainable and sustainability should be for us. Impact and sustainability always go hand in hand and we neglect sustainability in everything. Um, in, in, in what we do in ECD, we need to look very carefully at what will make the capacity sustained and the initiatives to build capacities sustained in the parts of the world that need it most. And for this purpose, we need to focus on institution building. You know, funding institutions who can train, in other words, train trainers, institutions who can do research, who can, who can promote training. Our universities are completely underfunded in terms of helping to build capacities from there. And also, of course, service institutions like this Office of Statistics and others. We have to make sure, I mean, I here I speak as a believer that development of any kind will not be sustained or endure unless we are able to have healthy institutions contextualized for our own purposes, uh, our own contexts, uh, and that can manage our strategies for ECD and promote our own capacities and our own research and our own ways of doing evaluation in sustained way driven by our own institutions. So funding institutional development is really critical and funding it both from within and from without. In all cases now, there is a need for a shift to us taking responsibility in the South or in the, in the younger countries taking responsibility for our own ECD with the support of people who have been very committed and passionate about doing that in our part of the world. Many thanks, Zenda, for, for this summary and, and the discussion on the topics that we have been talking about. Uh, I think uh, you have set the basis for the takeaway take messages from, from uh, this session and the ones that, that I, would, I would list uh, still summarizing what you have, you have discussed is, in a way, it is important to start thinking about evaluation capacity by recognizing where the capacity is. And that does not necessarily follow the traditional aid funding relationships. And there, from there grows the opportunity of learning together in a, in a new way. The financing issue is, is a different issue, but we fall into the trap of, of th that power relationship too easily. And here we are in a unique, unique situation. That has started in our partners. Uh, secondly, I think the, the thing of uh, finding the appropriate context for evaluation capacity development 
and the best link may not be to evaluation. We need once again to break the silo, advocate to colleagues who work in different fields, to other sectors, to political decision makers, to, to commissioners. So finding the hook, hooks that will, will carry. And then finally, the important issue of, of better coordination of the, of the existing initiative, initiatives based on a clear concept, well thought through concept of what evaluation capacity development actually is. Do the panelists or Winston want to add uh, simple takeaway issues in addition to, to what has been summarized? If not, then it's my pleasure to, first of all, thank the audience <laughs> who has uh, spent the last session uh, with us this afternoon, and then uh, Winston for an excellent uh, presentation that set us the, the stage, the panelists, and, and Zenda. Thank you very much.